Welcome to Unforbidden Truth. I'm Andrew. On this week's episode, I'll be speaking with Terry Hobbs, the stepfather of Stevie Branch, one of the three boys killed in what is known as the West Memphis Three killings. On May 5th, 1993, three eight-year-old boys, Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byers, went out to ride bicycles and allegedly were last seen by three neighbors in West Memphis, Arkansas, around 6.30 p.m. They claimed they saw Terry Hobbs calling them to come home. The first call to police was made by Christopher's father, John Mark Byers, around 7 p.m. that night. There wasn't much of an effort to search for the boys the night they were reported missing. The following morning, a search and rescue mission was set up by Crittenden County search and rescue personnel. When they started searching, they were canvassing all of West Memphis, but they focused their efforts on the Robin Hood Hills, where it was reported that the children were last seen. Even though there were so many people canvassing the area, they came up with nothing. Around 1.45 p.m. that day, juvenile parole officer Stephen Jones noticed a boy's black shoe floating in a muddy creek that led to a drainage canal in the Robin Hood Hills. After searching the canal, they came across the bodies of the three boys. The boys had been stripped naked and tied with their own shoelaces. Their right ankles were tied to their right wrist, and the same with the left ankle and left wrist. The boys' clothing was found in the creek. Some of it had been twisted around sticks and was pushed down in the canal. Most of their clothing was turned inside out, and their underwear has never been recovered. Christopher Byers suffered lacerations to several parts of his body, and his penis and scrotum had been mutilated. The autopsies were conducted by forensic pathologist Frank Peretti. He concluded that Byers died of multiple injuries, and more in Branch died of injuries from drowning. Police initially believed that the children had been raped. There were trace amounts of semen found on a pair of pants that were recovered from the crime scene. Prosecution experts claimed that Byers' wounds were that of a knife attack and that he had purposely been castrated by the murderer. Defense experts claimed that the mutilation to the penis and scrotum were done by animals post-mortem. Police believed the boys were assaulted and killed at the site their bodies were found, though other experts believed they were killed at another location. The three boys all went to school with each other and were all best friends. On the evening of the murders, workers in a Bojangles fast food restaurant, which was about a mile away from the crime scene, called 911 and reported that an African-American man, who seemed to be disoriented, came into the restaurant who was bleeding and covered in mud. By the time officers arrived at Bojangles, the man was gone and officers didn't even step foot inside to check it out and spoke to the manager through the drive through The day after the three children's bodies were found, the manager of the Bojangles called the police again, thinking the man that was there the night before might have something to do with the crime. The manager gave police a pair of sunglasses the man left, and officers took blood samples from the walls and tiles. That evidence would later become lost. West Memphis police officers James Sudbury and Stephen Jones thought these crimes might be motivated by the occult and an 18-year-old kid by the name of Damien Eccles might have something to do with them. Damien was interested in occultism and had strange hobbies and beliefs which made him different than everybody else in the area. Officer Jones felt that Damien was capable of murder, even going as far to kill children. The police interviewed Damien two days after the bodies were discovered. For the next month or so, they would focus their sights on Damien. On June 13th, a 17-year-old kid by the name of Jesse Miskelly Jr. was questioned by police without family present. Jesse's father gave police permission to take his son downtown to ask him some questions, but he didn't give them permission to interrogate him, and he was interrogated for over 12 hours. Even though he was questioned for over 12 hours, there's only a total of 46 minutes of that which was recorded. Not long after Jesse's infamous confession came to light, he recanted his statement claiming that he was coerced and received threats from the police department. He specifically stated that he was afraid of the police. Part of Jesse's confession was leaked to the press before any of the three trials started. Shortly after his confession, police arrested his friends, Damian Eccles, and his friend Jason Baldwin. There's a woman by the name of Vicki Hutchison who had recently moved to West Memphis when the murders occurred. Vicki was accused of stealing money from her former employer in West Memphis. On June 1st, 1993, Jesse introduced Damien to Vicky. Vicky had bugged her house with microphones and had a wire she was wearing, hoping to catch Damien talking about incriminating things. The police concluded that the recordings were inconclusive and there was no substantial evidence of Damien speaking about the murders. A little less than a month after the murders, Vicky went to police and she claimed that Damien had bragged about killing the three kids at a Wiccan meeting they both attended. After providing that information to police, Vicky was never charged with the theft. Vicky would later go on to recant her testimony and said that the only reason that she testified was so that she wouldn't do any time for the theft and she wanted the reward money. All three defendants pled not guilty. Jesse was tried by himself while Damien and Jason were tried together. 
Jesse Miskelly's confession was the basis of the three men being convicted. Jesse Miskelly was convicted of first degree murder and two counts of second degree murder. He received a life sentence plus 40 years in prison. Jason received a life sentence and Damian Eccles was sentenced to death. There's been a lot of criticism over the years with how the West Memphis Police Department handled the crime scene. The bodies were removed from the water before the coroner arrived on scene to examine the bodies and determine the stage of rigor mortis. The police didn't call the coroner until almost two hours after they found one of the boys' shoes floating in the canal. Law enforcement wasn't able to drain the creek in time to preserve any of the evidence. There was a small amount of blood that was found at the crime scene that had never been tested. In 1996, an HBO documentary by the name of Paradise Lost was released, which was followed by Paradise Lost 2 and 3. These documentaries brought this case to the forefront of the media and celebrities such as Johnny Depp, Peter Jackson, Natalie Maines, Eddie Vedder, and others started advocating for the three men convicted of these murders, known as the West Memphis Three. In 2003, Vicki Hutchison, who played a part in securing the arrest of Eccles, Baldwin, and Miskelly, recanted her statement. She did an interview with the Arkansas Times. She admitted every word she told police was made up, and that police had told her that if she did not cooperate with them, her child would have been taken away from her. She claimed that when she visited the police station, there were photos of Eccles, Miskelly, and Baldwin taped to the wall that officers would use to throw darts at. She also claims that the audio tape police said was garbled, that they eventually lost, was crystal clear, and had no incriminating statements on it. Fourteen years after the three murders, DNA collected from the crime scene was tested. None of the DNA matched Eccles, Miskelly, or Baldwin. The hair that was in question was found on one of the ligatures which was used to bind one of the boys. The state stood behind its convictions and were certain the West Memphis Three were the ones responsible for the crimes. On May 5th, 2009, Pamela Hobbs gave a declaration in the United States District Court, Eastern District of Arkansas. The declaration reads as follows. Additionally, after the murders, my sister Jo Lynn McHughey and I found in Terry's nightstand a knife that Stevie carried with him constantly, and which I had believed was with him when he died. It was a pocket knife that my father had given to Stevie, and Stevie loved that knife. I had been shocked that the police did not find it with Stevie when they found his body. I had always assumed that my son's murderer had taken the knife during the crime. I could not believe that it was in Terry's things. He had never told me that he had it. Also, my sister Jo Lynn told me that she saw Terry wash clothes, bed linens, and curtains from Stevie's room at an odd time around the time of the murder. There was additional new evidence discovered in 2007 that I cannot now recall. In 2008, it was revealed that the jury foreman on the Eccles Baldwin trial had previously discussed the case with an attorney prior to deliberating. He was accused of presenting his personal opinion to jurors about the three being guilty and sharing inadmissible evidence such as the Miskelly statements with other jurors. Legal experts have argued that at the time if this would have come out, it could have resulted in the reversal of the convictions of both Eccles and Baldwin. In 2008, Daniel Stidham, who is now a judge, was Miskelly's trial attorney he testified at a post-conviction relief hearing that the trial judge, David Burnett, made improper comments to jurors on numerous occasions. Stidham heard the judge talking to the jury foreman about taking a lunch break, to which the judge replied, You'll need food when you come back for sentencing. After the jury foreman asked the judge what happens if an acquittal comes about, the judge then closed his door and didn't answer him. On October 29, 2007, papers were filed in court by Damian Eccles' legal team seeking a retrial or an immediate release from prison. The file included the new DNA evidence and new statements from Hobbs' ex-wife, Pamela, the mother of Stevie Branch. Eccles' legal team also presented new expert testimony that the alleged knife marks and injuries to Christopher Byers' genitals were in fact that of animals, which was done post-mortem. On November 10, 2010, the Arkansas Supreme Court ordered a new judge to consider whether the DNA evidence was enough to exonerate the West Memphis Three. The justices also had the newly appointed judge to examine the misconduct by jurors whom had sentenced Damien to death and the two others to life in prison. In December 2010, David Burnett was elected to the Arkansas State Senate. Circuit Court Judge David Laser was appointed to replace David Burnett and presided in the following hearings. On August 19, 2011, after being wrongfully convicted and sitting in prison for 18 years and 78 days, Damien, Jason, and Jesse were released from prison under an Alfred plea. An Alfred plea is a guilty plea in which a defendant maintains their innocence, but admits the prosecution's evidence would likely result in a guilty verdict if brought to trial. Under the deal all three received, each man had to enter an Alfred plea to lesser charges of first and second degree murder while verbally stating their innocence. Judge Lacer sentenced them to time served, and each of them were given a suspended imposition sentence of 10 years. If any of them re-offend, they can be sent back to prison for 21 years. 
As part of their plea deal, none of the three are able to pursue civil action against the state of Arkansas for unlawful incarceration. In 2011, supporters of the West Memphis Three were nonstop relentless on trying to get the governor to pardon the three. He stated he would deny issuing pardons unless there was any evidence that somebody else had committed the crimes. Here's my interview with Terry Hobbs. I'm here with Terry Hobbs, the stepfather of Stevie Branch, one of the three young boys senselessly murdered in West Memphis, Arkansas in 1993. How's life treating you these days, Terry? Well, life is okay. I'm up here in the hills with these hillbillies and enjoying myself. Enjoying retirement? Yes, sir. And thank you for having me today. Let's start out by talking about the case. Can you give me a brief summary of what happened to your stepson and the two other boys for those that might be listening that don't necessarily know about the case or are missing details? Well, in 1993, May the 5th, three young boys went out to play, ride bicycles, and never came home. And so... To us, the parents, we didn't know what was going on, didn't know what was up. So we started looking around, calling around, doing what parents do, and couldn't find nothing, never came home. And so then, you know, as we continued our look, we got friends involved. There was neighbors involved. There was lots of people involved in helping us look. We couldn't come up with nothing. So... You know, the next morning, here shows the media. This is May the 6th, the morning of May the 6th. Here shows the media up to kind of bring a little light on things. So after this, you know, it wasn't long after that. that, You know, we tried to get some help all through the night from different sources. And, you know, we finally, the, the morning of May the 6th, everybody starts showing up. Here comes the search and rescue that we'd been trying to get out there to help us that night. And here they showed up. So from then on, we were excluded from the area that we were looking in. And search and rescue took over. So as they sent us over here to do what, you know, search over here. They did their thing, and, you know, I think it was a helicopter come in from Memphis that kind of assisted in the search, and together they, you know, they found our three boys that we'd been looking for all night long. What were the emotions like while they were looking for the boys? Well, you know, you kind of, you know, you're in a little shock. You're in, you're panicking a little bit. You can't show it. You know, because you don't know what's up, and we're just trying to maintain our self and, you know, just hang in there and hope for the best and look and hope we find them. There was tensions, there was words, there was attitudes, you know, and all because they went out to play. So what was life like for you prior to meeting your ex-wife, Pamela? Well, I had a good life. <laughs> yeah, my, I worked in my dad's, in the family business. We had 32 restaurants, seafood restaurants, and that's what, how we made our living. You know, he started one, he franchised them, ended up with 32. I owned one in Blyville, Arkansas, where I met Pam. I think then he was, Stevie was probably a year and a half, if I recall. Yeah, he was a little dude. What was the home life like with Stevie, yourself, and Pamela? Well, we had a good home. You know, we, we had a 33,000 gallon in ground pool in the backyard. We had a diving board, swimming pool, and uh, had a nice home. And I think it was four bedroom home. And we both were working. Just, you know, we thought we was living the American dream. What was Pamela's relationship like with Stevie as well as your relationship with him like? Well, I thought we was good parents. And I still to this day believe that we were good parents. I kept him on the uh, principal's list at school with his grades. He was on a roll principal's list and I helped him do that. You know, we just had a good time, had a good life. He he probably got to do more than a lot of kids did at his age. At the time of the murders, you and your ex-wife at the time had a four-year-old daughter. 
what was her relationship like with Stevie? Were they close? Well, yeah, she was four and he was eight when this happened. So there's a little gap there that, you know, that was there and they was just brother and sister. Yeah, we had a good home good, and they had a good relationship. When the kids went missing at the time and when they were later found murdered, did she know what was going on? Did she did she have any idea? Probably not. You know, we tried to keep every bit of every part of it that we could away from her. And we didn't we didn't want her to know all that. It was kind of a shock to everybody. Did she ever ask where Stevie was or anything like that? And if she did, what did you guys tell her? Well, you know, after we, she asked several times and we would just tell her, you know, Jesus come and got him, he's in heaven, you know, and so then we had to explain that we did all this, you know, four years old. What kind of person was Stevie like? Well, if he would have made it, you know, lived and all this, he'd been a heartbreaker. (laughs) <laughs> to the girls <laughs> he was eight years old and, you know blonde hair blue eyes and you know i guess girls love that in guys but he was full of energy and he loved camping and we loved camping so we went we done lots of camping back then and swimming and going to parks and you know just whatever we wanted to do we did it so would you say you spent a lot of time with him Sure. About six and a half years. I worked during the day. Pam worked during the night. So she was with them all day and I will come home and I stayed with everybody through the night. Your stepson and his two friends were eight years old at the time when they were senselessly murdered. Do you remember the moment that you and your wife got word that Stevie and his two friends were murdered? I do. I do, and we was living in Blyville, Arkansas. We'd moved from West Memphis to Blyville shortly after this happened. And we, I get a phone call one day from West Memphis Police Department telling me that they'd like to, us to attend a uh, hearing in the morning, the next morning, in West Memphis Court. And we're going to see who is being charged for this. And, yeah, I can remember that shock. It was, I mean, shock was around for a long time, you know, and and grief dealing with the early stages of grief. You know, we were dealing with that too. After Damian Eccles, Jesse Miskelly, and Jason Baldwin were arrested, how did you and Pamela react? And at the time, were you guys talking to the other families of the other uh, children? How did you guys all react to them being arrested and charged? And, and uh, actually, Damien Eccles was facing the death penalty at the time, which he received. How, how did you guys uh, feel about all that? Well, you, your feelings don't really matter, you know? I mean, the process is doing what it's going to do, you know? So you just tossed into this process, and you're just going along with it, you know? You're not liking it. You shouldn't have to be there, but you're there. So while you're there, you make the best of everything that happens. And there was a lot that happened. <laughs> I promise you. It was terrible. It was something that you should, no one should have to deal with. No one should have to be brought into something like that. You know, and it just turns your whole world upside down. And it did ours. When you guys did go to court and see who did get charged, what was going through your guys' head at the time? Probably revenge, you know, probably, you know, we didn't really know. We didn't know what to expect. They wouldn't tell you nothing. You just had to show up, and that's how we found out. So I can imagine every worst scenario that you can imagine that follows revenge. Did you or Pamela have any interaction with any of the three individuals that were charged at the time? No. No, we didn't know them, so we didn't have no reason to have anything to do with them. We didn't know them. Never never even thought about people. We just worked and came home and run our home and made a living. 
We didn't go hang out. You know, I heard that them boys hung out the roller skate, skate ring. We didn't hang out there. You know, we worked and come home. So after the three individuals were arrested, Jesse Miskelly confessed to the murders. He would later go on to recant his confession. What do you think of that confession as well as him recanting his confession? Well, I think, you know, I think he had somewhat of a conscience. It's why he confessed. You know, he, and I'm sure he had to feel bad if you had any conscience to see what happened. You know, I don't know. I don't know what happened out there, and I've, I'm sure all of us has just played it over in our mind what has happened. I know we have, but you, you know, if he, to me, if a human has any conscience, they would feel some remorse and want to try to make some kind of amends, even if it's confessing, say, yes, we did it, and yes, they did it. I'm not trying to sound insensitive when I ask you this, but I'm curious. Who initially identified Stevie's body? I don't think anybody identified him. The police come around and ask for photos from all the from us, and I'm I'm sure they did to others, the Moors and the Byers, but we give them photos, and that's how they identified him. Even during that process, there was a mistake made, but we give them photos. What was the mistake that was made? Well, they claimed it was the Michael Moore that was castrated, and it wasn't, it was Christopher. So, you know, I, I think everything was done through photos. So shortly after the murders of Stevie, Christopher, and Michael, you and Pamela moved. What was life like during the time after they were arrested, and why the sudden move uh, at the time? Well, we... Uh, this, the reason for the move, cause we was going to bury Stevie in Blyville. There's a out there where some of her Pam's is from Blyville and so on. And the, one of the cemeteries is where some of her family was buried. And her dad had bought some plots out there for his family. So we used one of their plots that they had to bury Stevie in. So that's why we moved. And what was life like? A disaster. A roller coaster of emotions, rocky emotions. Did you and Pamela take time off work for a while, or did you guys just go back to work and deal with it? How how was how was uh, your home life like? Well, we did the time away from work. You had to, cause you know you just tossed out there in a world of shock. And we did. We took the time. We signed up for some grief share classes and. You know, and we learned some things. We probably ignored some things, and but we tried to carry on. You know, we tried to do the best we could given the situation that we was in. Do you think his confession was coerced by authorities? No, because I think he was advised not to do it by the authorities. I think he was advised not to do it by his attorneys. And he done it anyway. I think there was one confession he done on the Bible. Do you yourself believe all three individuals are guilty? Sure. I don't know what else to believe. I don't you know. I, I sit through the trials every day. And yeah, I kind of believe it, you know, that the police department done the best they could do. And they come up with uh, charges, investigation charges, trials, uh, convictions, and, and sentences. I, I believe that all that was, it was proper. As we all know, this case was heavily televised at the time, um, and I'm sure you guys are being nonstop hounded by the media. How did you guys deal with the trial that was going on, the nonstop harassment by media and other people in the public? How did you guys cope and how did you guys seem to de-stress with all that going on? Well, they was there. The media was everywhere. And I tried to stay away from them. I, I wasn't there for showtime. You know, we was there because we had to be there. And uh, some of the, some and everybody's seen all this, you know, some of them just got out there and 
made a big show. You know, I don't know why, but they done it in a way. So you let them do what they do. I did what I did and I stayed away and, you know, tried to stay out of the, talking to them. But sometimes you just had to. They'd hem you up, pin you up in the corner. You had to say something. Right. I'm sure emotions were running high for not only you and Pamela, but the other parents and everybody sure. involved in the case, for that matter, investigators and whoever was on scene. There was. All three individuals are charged and convicted. Miss Kelly is sentenced to life in prison plus 40 years. Baldwin was sentenced to life and Damien Eccles received the death penalty. How did you guys feel about each sentence at the time of their convictions? Well, you know, as as watching the system do what it does, just, they don't really care about your feelings. You were asked some things. We were. We were asked some things about the sentencing. And, but at the end of the day, we still had to go along with what the state was offering. You know, there was a lesser sentence for Miss Kelly for the confession. Those are, you know, let's, let's knock some of this off. I mean, that's how, that's how it's played. And so you just has, as a victim on this side of it, you just have to go along with it. And we do, you know, not wanting to, begrudging to. We wanted to see it, all three of them on death row. But that's not how it worked. What are your thoughts on all three of them after they were convicted and later released under an Alfred plea? Well, I was kind of hurt. You know, if you remember prior to them being released, okay, they was parading around all over the news, TV, newspapers. We got new evidence. We got new evidence. You might remember, remember that, correct? Right. Well, some of us was waiting to see what this new evidence was. I, they even approached the Arkansas Supreme Court, and they granted them a new evidential hearing, if you remember that. Well, I was just looking forward to this, but I was not aware of any new evidence. However, I know what they was talking about. So I just couldn't wait to see this come up in the court. Okay, so with this in mind, you know, some of us believe in, yeah, we get to finally get to see this new evidence that they're talking about because the Supreme Court said here, yeah, you can have this here. Well, the next thing you hear that they're, uh, we're getting a phone call from the uh, DA's office, the new DA, not Brent, Scott Ellington, is the new DA. He called us up and said, we're going to let them out. What are you talking about? You know, they're supposed to have this evidential hearing. How are they getting out? They ain't proved nothing. Well, we, we've made a plea with them. What's the plea? They confess it. And we're going to let them out. Well, that didn't make sense. What about this hearing there that we uh, thought they was going to do? You know, so really they misled everybody all through this with this new evidence. They lied on people. They lied to people. And they, to, in order to get to the Supreme Court, so they made it up there and they got their hearing. Well, why, why didn't you go through with it? Because there never was any new evidence, like they were saying. So they misled the public. They misled the celebrities. They misled the money, but it all worked for them. A scam. I've been waiting on the Supreme Court to step up and call them out on it. I guess that won't happen. I don't see how you can how you sit there for 18 years. You know, I would have executed him 17 years ago <laughs> if it did me. You know, I understand that, but it happened. Right. So over the years, the West Memphis Police Department has come under scrutiny due to the investigation of the murders of the three boys. How do you feel the investigation of the murders of your stepson and his two friends were handled? Well, I don't know how they handled it. You know, we only we was called down there once in a while, come down and talk to us, let's update, let's visit and all this kind of stuff. We did all that. 
So I'm not going to say the investigation was bad, wrong, whatever. I had nothing to do with that. You know, so I'm going to say they've done a good job. I ain't mad at them. Did police ever go through formal questioning with you and were you polygraphed at all? Because I, I know over the years there's been speculation, you know, yourself, John Mark Byers and, and countless others have, have come into question. And I'm just curious about that. Sure. I answered. I was at all the meetings when they wanted us to dance. As a matter of fact, we had one meeting where they wanted just the dads to show up. So we went. And then there was occasion they'd come by the house. There was occasion they'd call us down to the police department. Now, why all of this was lost, and I over the years I think I've come to hear that it had been lost. I don't know. Don't care. I answered the questions back then. I answered them in 07 or 08, whenever they called me back down there. I did fingerprints, feet prints, all kind of things, and uh, DNA. It didn't bother me. Did they ever officially interrogate you, or did they just ask you questions? Both. In 07 or 08, they interrogated me, but back in 93, just answer, ask questions. We wasn't suspects. We never right. was. Still right. are not. Yeah, and so then they're going to treat you like a suspect if you're not. So did you ever have to uh, hire any type of legal counsel at the time when they were questioning you or anything like that to get them off your back? No. I volunteered to go down in 2007. To, I didn't have to, but somebody called me up and said, would you? I said, I'd be glad to. Be right there. I don't need legal counsel. Did it make you feel any type of way that you were being looked at as a possible person of interest, or do you think that they were just following up on all leads and tips that they've received? I never was a person of interest, never. And so, like I said, I volunteered after my phone call. I volunteered, and I think it was just a line of questions that they wanted to ask that probably asked some of the other parents. So I went down there and answered them, answered them. What do you think of your ex-wife claiming that you had some type of involvement in the homicides? I think if they would leave their habits alone, they could function better. You know, you can say anything you want. I could say anything I want about anybody. That's how it's, that's how it's done out here. But it has no meaning to it. The police has never looked at me like that just because she said so. You know, and, and it'd be nice sometimes just to see her Keep her mouth shut. And a matter of fact, let me say this. A lot of times I would call her right after I would see it on TV and say, what are you doing? She'd cry and start apologizing. But and turn right around a few days, weeks, months, whatever later and do it again. <laughs> so I would call her again. Why are you doing this? She would apologize. That's just how she is. Do you think it was in spite of you, or does, do you think she really thinks you had something to do with it? Could have been during the, the divorce. You know, I got custody of my daughter in my divorce, and I raised my daughter. And, uh, you know, Pam, years ago, asked me to marry her, the, our first marriage. So I did. So after the divorce, Pam would come back and ask me to marry her again. I said, no. No way. You know, once is enough with you. And I think rejection <laughs> had a lot to do with that. And in spite of what happened with their brother, you know, you know, they wanted to get even with me for some things. And, you know, and I never, I've never been out to hurt nobody. Still am. Let's talk about John Mark Byers, the late adopted father of Christopher Byers. Throughout the first two movies, the Paradise Lost movies, a lot of people speculated that he might have had something to do with the murders of the three boys due to his erratic behavior and lie after lie he was caught up in. Before we talk about all that, what was your very first impression of him when you met him versus when you first saw him on film in the Paradise Lost movies? Well, I didn't know Mark, you know, and uh, this is how I met him was through all this. 
But I can tell you something that's better than Paradise Lost. I mean, if people have some questions, go look at the Gerardo uh, Rivera interviews that we done back in the 93s, 94s, I believe. And that, that there's a lot of stuff on that he asked that it was answered right then that was fresh on everybody's mind. But people don't want to look at that. They want to look at this uh, Joe Berlinger, uh, Paradise Lost 1 and 2 and 3, and, you know, draw a conclusion. But go look at something that's more credible if you want to see something. Gerardo Rivera. What was your first impression of him when you met him? He's just a big hillbilly-looking dude. <laughs> kind of, he's a big dude. He's six, eight and a half, and just a big boy, you know. And I, I didn't have an impression, you know. I just thought, well, wow, that's a, that's a hillbilly-looking dude to me. I didn't have, I didn't, you know, con- draw a conclusion on him. I know I can say this: the night of May the fifth, you know, we was all together at several different times. We were all apart at several different times while we searched uh, most of the night, you know, doing, and we could see each other, and, you know. So, yeah, his uh, alibi to me is pretty credible. He was out in them woods with us, riding around, doing the same thing we was doing, looking for our kids. Was he different that you could notice on camera as opposed to being off camera? I know in the third movie, I believe it was, a supporter of the West Memphis Three made a comment to him that he was more friendly off camera as to where uh, cameras were pointed to him that his demeanor would change. Well, I noticed that. I think everybody noticed that. He's, I think, you know, and I think it was Paradise Number Two where they give him some money to get out there and just act like he was acting. And, and yeah, he did. He, he was all about showtime to me when he was on camera. Why do you think that was? For the money. They asked all of us to do the number Paradise Lost 2, and we didn't want to. And Mark said, hey, they give me a little money, and I'll get out there and put them on a show. And, and he did. Over the years, um, it's been it's been reported that your nephew allegedly told his friends that you had murdered three little boys and the family and, and it was the family secret. And there's been a lot of talk amongst the public over the years that you might have had something to do with the murders. What do you have to say to those people that are listening right now? I'm a good seller and hillbilly. Yeah, I say that with pride. And I don't hurt people. I've never had murdered anybody in my life. And uh, that's not going to happen out of me. And what my nephew said, he didn't say. They said he said. He didn't say that. I went to him myself and talked to him about it. And he said, I don't care. I didn't say that. And, of course, the friends he hang around with are his friends. I don't know them, never seen them. And, but uh, there's, there are a few family secrets that we have. And I might share one with you. It's a secret. Okay? Don't share it. <laughs> <laughs> Being in the restaurant business. Huh? My uh, mother made our own hush puppy recipe. Them are our family secrets. We don't have any family secrets that we hide from anybody. Can you explain a little bit about what your issues were with Natalie Maines and the Dixie Chicks? Well, I didn't know anything about the Natalie Maines and the Dixie Chicks. I you know, only heard of them through country music, and I kind of liked their music. you know. And then all of a sudden, they jump out here and jump on the bandwagon of hating on Terry. You know, and I just didn't understand that. And I had a couple of attorneys get a hold of me and say, hey, you know, let's fight this thing. So I, you know, they did what they did, and and I went along with it. You know, just to shut them up, get them off my back, and you know, and that was only the beginning. You know, if that judge would have allowed us to go through with that, we had, there was others in line that was fixing to be dealt with also. But you know, they shot that down out of federal courts and called me a public figure and wouldn't let me sue them. 
And did you guys end up appealing it? No, we did not. You know, my attorney said, you know, let's just let's agree to this these conditions and you know, let them settle this this and be through with it. So that's what we did. I wanted to appeal it. They they said, you know, let's just cut it off here. You know, you made your point and let's move on. When Jesse Miskelly was first questioned, he denied any involvement in the killings. And shortly before he confessed, investigators said they showed him some crime scene photos to evoke a response. Do you think that might have scared Jesse into confessing the crimes he didn't commit? Well, I'm not sure. He, you know, he said he did it. He said he helped them do it. He said he chased Michael Moore down, brought him back, and, you know, whatever. But I'm not sure what happened out there. But to me... He confessed eight or nine times over the years, and I don't know what made him confess other than to me it might have been a conscience. During the investigation of the homicides of the three boys, police divers searched a lake near the trailer that Jason Baldwin was living in, and they found a bloody knife within an hour. And after DNA tests were conducted, the tests were inconclusive. What do you think of the bloody knife that was found? Do you think that was planted by police to secure a conviction in the case? Well, I had no idea. You know, surely they wouldn't do something like that. I'm sure that happened somewhere, but uh, hopefully it didn't happen in our case. Did you or Pam receive any compensation for your participation in the first movie? Well, the all the money in the first movie went to the mothers. The dads didn't want them around. I was one of them dads, and the dads didn't want their money. I was one of them dads. So they went around us, they went straight to the women, and weaseled their way in. On May 5th, the local police department received a call from Bojangles, a fast food restaurant, and it was located a mile from the crime scene. They reported that an African-American man covered in blood and mud came into the restaurant. What do you think of that? Well, I've heard that story like everybody else for years. And, you know, I don't know what to think about it. I don't know. It's it's out there, and I don't know. Some say it was ketchup on him. I don't know what was on him, and don't know what to think about it. Don't really have any right to elaborate on it. Over the years, I know that you've said that you're convinced that the three boys that were convicted of the murders are responsible but have you ever considered the fact that somebody else or multiple peoples for that matter might be responsible for the crime? Well, you know, I'll say this again. I've said it a million times until I see or until it's proven, you know, to us out here, everybody that someone else is responsible. I've only believed what the police has always told me. I believe what I sit in the courts and heard and seen out of the witnesses that, that they had on the stand in the courts. And to me, back in the 93s, you know, 94s, during these trials that, you know, that made my mind up back then. And today, you know, I have all this stuff that I've seen over the years. I haven't seen anything that would convince me otherwise if i didn't believe that these guys done it and i thought if i thought someone else done it the whole world would know it from me if you had the chance to talk to stevie one more time what would be the words that you would say to him i don't know you know this we just we had a good time when we when he was around i don't i just keep on you know, being myself and keep on having a good time with him. I don't know what I would say. Depends on what you're doing at the time, what you, you know, what, how you would address that. In 2007, it came forward that there was new evidence related to the case, none of which was a match to the three convicted of the murders. There was DNA, which they say was linked to you, found on one of the ligatures that it was on Christopher Byers, as well as the hair sample that was found on a tree stump at the crime scene which was a match to your friend, David Jacoby, who was with you hours before the murders, according to your statement to police. What do you make of the DNA evidence that was tested that was a match to you and Jacoby? 
Well, you, first you have to look at where the uh, who put all these statements out here. This is a defense team that had an agenda, and that was to get three, to me, child killers out of prison, and they were going to do whatever that they could come up with to uh, achieve that goal. Okay, now back to your DNA uh, question. There was so much DNA out there that, you know, none of it was ever talked about. You know, and that one piece of hair, that doesn't bother me. You know, them boys played in my home, and if they picked up some hair off of whoever, why, you know, that that means nothing to me. Now, as far as David Jacoby's hair being out in the woods, well, it should be. Mine was probably out in the woods more places, and they probably never did find it. You know, we was out in the in them woods looking together. You know, I was by myself. I was with Mark Byers. I was with Pam. I was with her family. You know, we was all out in them woods at different times that night doing what we were doing, looking for our kids. So, no, just because the defense claims new DNA evidence, there wasn't any or they would not have pled guilty. They would have uh, went to that evidential hearing that the Arkansas Supreme Court granted them and proved their case, which they had no case. They knew that. It's why their attorneys encouraged them to plead guilty. At least you'll get out of prison. And I'm sure that new DNA evidence coming up has probably been hard on you over the years. I know that the new DNA evidence is what made people, you know, look at you as a person of interest. And have you had a hard time over the years with with that evidence being out there? There's no evidence. I've had a hard time over the years of them smearing my name through the mud with their lies. There is no new evidence. Never has been. And we've all known this. We was waiting on them to, you know, go to that evidential hearing that they was granted once again so we could all see just what they's talking about. And guess what? Just before their day in court come up, they decide to plead guilty. What that to me is is a lame move. If you are so convinced and you've misled the public for years, why didn't you go ahead and prove your case? There was no case for them to prove. They lied. They lied to Arkansas Supreme Courts. And it's just like, oh, well, let's let them out of prison, plead guilty. There was never no new evidence. I know over the years there's been conflicting reports about you seeing the children on the day of the murders. Did you actually see the children that day? And if not, when did you last see them? Well, once again, uh, I did not see any of any three of them little boys on the day of May the 5th. And when I actually, last time I had seen them, I couldn't answer that because I don't know. I know I've seen Stevie every day at home, but, you know, before the 5th. But on the day of the 5th, no, I did not once again see them boys at all. The day of May the 5th. Pam had claimed that you had a different set of clothes on when you picked her up from work than what you had on earlier that day. And after the crimes occurred, Pam found Stevie's pocket knife in your possession. What made you change your clothes before you picked up Pam that night? And how did Stevie's pocket knife end up in your possession that day? Well, I'm not sure if I changed my clothes. I probably did because I had my work clothes on. And I probably took a shower and put on some clean clothes after I got home, uh, maybe uh, after work. And may I may have, you know, I took her to work and picked her up. But as far as Stevie's pocket knife, uh, it's Stevie's granddaddy gave him that pocket knife. And it was a nice little pocket knife. But then to me, I always thought he was a little bit too young to be carrying a pocket knife. So I took the pocket knife and put it up until he would have been a you know a few years older, and I would have given it back to him. But I didn't get that chance. 
So you were just worried that he might have hurt himself? Yeah, hurt himself? he was too young to be carrying a pocket knife like he, like his granddad gave him. I mean, it was good intentions on, you know, the reason he gave it to him. But to me, just as a little seven, eight-year-old boy, that was a little bit too young for me to say, yeah, put that in your pocket and go out here. No, that was a little bit too young, I thought. In November of 1994, there was an incident involving you, your ex-wife, and her brother, Jackie Hicks, Jr. What all transpired that day at the residence? Well, it was just a big mess. You know, here you take in a group of a family, a, a two families, you know, my family, me and Pam, and then her family, you know, her brothers and sisters, dad and mom. You know, we we just lost a, a little boy, you know, and there's a lot of anger going around on both sides. As a matter of fact, with everybody involved. So, you know, me and Pam got to squabbling over some car keys, and she popped me, and I popped her back, and we wrestled around a little bit, you know, and it was over with, and she called her family and told them I broke her jaw. Here they come. You know, and her brother made the statement, he's going to kill me. And, you know, it ended up like it did. You know, and she didn't, I told her, I said, you don't have to call them. And, you know, I tried to, you know, I put ice on her jaw, you know, to help her out. And, you know, I, I felt bad. I felt seriously bad. But, you know, she popped me upside the head and I just retaliated before I knew what I was doing and popped her right back. You know, and so it ended like it did. And it was sad, and but it happened. Uh, you know, I apologized back then. I'm not going to apologize today over it because it's it's in the past. So after that incident, you were charged and convicted and sentenced to six months in prison. How did you feel when you were arrested, let alone convicted and sentenced to prison? I was not convicted. I was not sentenced. <laughs> That's crazy because everywhere that I've looked, it says that you did six months in prison for that. That's pretty uh, interesting because it says here that you were sentenced to six months in prison for aggravated assault. Oh, no, I wasn't. <laughs> I'll get it to you. Matter of fact, the case was dismissed. They wanted me to go to prison if I would agree to it and do five years. I said no. So, you know, the next uh, meeting, they want me to do four years, three years, two years, one year. And I said, no. And they said, well, it'll be a $50 fine if you'll plead guilty to shooting a firearm in the city limits. And I said, well, now, I did shoot the firearm in the city limits. I agreed to that. And we paid the $50 fine and went on. Never did I do a day in prison over that. Never was I convicted of that. Did not happen. They're not going to update it because it's, you know, it's it's sensationalism, you know. Let's pick on Terry, you know. Here's, he went to prison. No, I ain't never been to prison. <laughs> Pertaining to the case of the three boys, there have been so many twists and turns involving this case. At one point in time, there were two criminal informants, Billy Wayne Stewart and Benny David Guy, that gave sworn statements 20 years after the crime occurred. They both claim that you, David Jacoby, L.G. Hollingsworth, and a guy by the name of Buddy Lucas had killed the three boys after they stumbled upon you guys smoking weed in the Robin Hood Hills. How did that story come about? And were you smoking weed with the three guys the day of the crimes in Robin Hood Hills? Well, let me clear this up for you. I don't recognize any of them names other than the LG Hollingsworth. I've heard it over the years on social media. Uh, Buddy Lucas, I've heard that name over social media only. Never met these guys in my life that I'm aware of and sure has never smoked weeds with any of them out in the woods or anywhere else in my entire life. Don't know where this story come from, don't know who put it out there, but if that didn't happen. Before we conclude this interview, is there anything that you'd like to say or talk about that we, that we haven't covered yet? Yeah, you wouldn't you would be surprised at the uh hate mail that I get. 
from people all around the world, the threats that I get from people all around the world. And then I'm going to share this one with you. I told this to a couple people, but never on a podcast. A few years ago, uh, I'm at work in Memphis. I just, when I was still living in Memphis, I get a call to come home. I have to come home. I say, what do you mean? The police are here at your house. So I go home. When I get home, the street's blocked off. Police cars everywhere. My house is police cars standing, or police officers in front of my yard in the house. I walk in, and they get up and they shake my hand. Mr. Hobbs, it's nice to meet you, but you need to go with us. And I said, well, let's go. Where are we going? I'm going downtown. You need to go up and talk to the men sitting up top of that building up there waiting to see you, waiting to meet you. And I said, okay, let's go. So they escorted us downtown. Me, my daughter, and my lady, we all three went. Well, when I'm getting, when I'm downtown, I find out, I'm asking why, what's, go, what's going on, how come I'm being escorted down here, for what reason? Well, John Mark Byers had got a hold of uh, Amy Bird, who made that West of Memphis documentary. He threatened to kill me on May the 5th that year. Now, he was so convincing to her, Amy, that Amy turns around and calls the Arkansas State Police. Well, they couldn't find me. I didn't live in Arkansas. I lived in Tennessee. So they got a hold of Arkansas State Police, contacted Homeland Security. Okay, Homeland Security zeroed in on me. All right, now, Homeland Security contacted Memphis Police Department. So Memphis Police Department shows up at my home, summons me home from work, escorts me downtown, and tells me all this. And I am just blown away. Now, their reason for bringing me downtown was they were trying to locate John Mark Byers to de-escalate the threat. And so during all this, you know, they, you know, we just talked about everything. I was trying to figure out where he lived. And uh, he was living with his brother, George Byers, that lived in Mumford, Tennessee. He got a brother. And he was living with George, and no one knew that. So I guess over the course of the time after that, weeks after that, before May the 5th, and of course that's when I always go to the Reading Grove in West Memphis at the elementary school, and I do a little memorial for the boys there. And so that he was gonna, Mark said he was gonna kill me there. So I get to the Reading Grove on May the 5th and they got a big camera the police had already come out and installed this big camera just to be sure and safe, I guess. And, and uh, but anyway, we, we went down on memorial, but I guess they had found him. And, you know, whatever they'd done, I never heard anything else about it after about three or four hours sitting down there answering questions and, you know, talking with them. And they treated me like a respectable person. He never was never bad to us, and, uh, but you know you go through stuff like that. Now that was the haters. Now on the support side, you would not believe it. It is phenomenal at the people who get a hold of me and said we really think a lot of you. I've got so many friends. You only have five thousand on your Facebook account, okay, and. and I could have 25,000 if I could accept them all because people out here are looking for somebody to believe in, somebody to get a little strength from, a little encouragement from. And when I don't know how I pop up in their picture somewhere, or I guess Facebook has hair, let's get Hobbs. You know, you, need, you got some issues, get a hold of Hobbs. I get this all the time. And it's it's uh, unbelievable to me, but again, I have talked to so many people, 
that it's 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 kind of like you know you get a blessing out of it you know and some people tell me that you need to be a life coach you know and i've i've thought about something like that you know and i'm still still kind of searching for something to do during the retirement years you know and i'd like to come up with something to encourage somebody to you know hang in there it's not as bad as you think if it is hang in there and write it out it'll blow over you know if worse push comes to shove stand your ground you know stand your ground take the high road you know you everybody hears about that and i think it's worked for me you know it's it's done me some good i've i'm hoping i've done others good i get a lot of this and a lot of that but at the end of the day i think i'm doing what i'm supposed to be doing and that is keep on keeping on keeping on pushing living this life enjoying it you wouldn't believe what i do <laughs> i enjoy myself <laughs> i seriously do <laughs> We had so much fun. Uh, just just to backtrack a little, in regards to John Mark Byers threatening to kill you, did he did he give you or police an explanation as to why he wanted to kill you or, or said why he wanted to kill you? I don't know anything about why. I just know what happened. Were you and ever in it, fear of your life? Well... You, you you put a Smith on one side and you put a Wesson on the other. And there's not much room for fear. Okay. Right. I play. You know, and, and no, I wasn't. I always looked over my back. And I think sometimes there's all these hating boards on the Internet. And I always wonder sometimes I report. I now I take Facebook. Facebook is bad. I mean, people think it's good and all this, and it may have some good points, but Facebook let these people get on there and start these hating pages, and there's several on there with my name. And I, I, someone will bring it to my attention, and I used to go on there and report it to Facebook. You know, it, it doesn't violate our community standards. That's all I ever get from Facebook. So you don't get to talk to a person. It's just a computerized uh answer and it's sickening that they allow this to do this and hopefully congress will break them down like they call themselves working on and make them held accountable for what they allow facebook is not really as good as people think and they do there's there i don't know how many is out there with my name on it and i had nothing to do with i don't know anything about it until someone brings it up or you can google it you can Facebook it and find out, but there's there's several out there. And I don't appreciate it on this side of it. They nothing you can do about it. They told me don't pick the post or the platform pick the post. If somebody says a bad comment about you, you know, pick the comment, not the post, but the comment. You know, and we'll delete the comment, but the other post and uh, whatever, they leave it up there. That's, to me, that's kind of wrong. That's big business. That was my interview with Terry Hobbs. Thank you for listening. I've never been